Thank you everyone for, for logging in here. I'm here with uh, Luke Hansen from Terracon and we'll be covering a rail track monitoring presentation, uh, covering a project that, uh, that Luke is on currently, has been on for um, some time and uh, cover the, the products used on there, jump into some detail. Uh, we have a full hour block for this. I'd imagine presentation should be somewhere around 30 minutes, then we'll move to a Q&A at the end. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Everyone will be on mute during this and questions can be entered in the, the questions window. You won't be able to ask those, but throughout the presentation, if you enter those questions in, we'll address those at the end. So thanks again. Yeah, we'll go ahead and, and get started here. Great. So, yep, agenda. Uh, Luke and I will do some quick introductions. Um, then I'll hand it over to Luke. We'll, he'll cover uh, what the Minneapolis light rail transit system is, uh, why track deformation monitoring was required, uh, the different monitoring systems that were used and are being used on the project, uh, what exactly is being measured uh, using this technology, uh, the data and alerting system uh, that they're employing, and, and then I'll take over and talk a little bit about the, the product features uh, and specifications, and then we'll wrap it up with the, the Q&A session. All right, thanks, Dan. I'm Luke Hansen. I'm a geotechnical engineer at Terracon uh, based in Minneapolis. You've probably seen Terracon around. If not, we're a nationwide uh, consulting engineering firm, uh, about 150 offices nationwide offering geotechnical, environmental facilities, and construction material services. Um, I myself, I've been in the geotechnical industry uh, over eight years with the last four or five really being uh, heavily involved with automated instrumentation and monitoring. So thanks for attending today. Dan, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Uh, Dan Miller, um, Head of Business Development uh, for the Americas for Sensive. Uh, Sensive is uh, based in the UK, a uh, manufacturer of different monitoring technology, products, wireless communication networks, um, worldwide distribution um, based out of New York. We have a office um, and uh, shipping and receiving facility in Houston, Texas. So all products that are distributed throughout the uh, North America and South America uh, now come out of Texas. Uh, my background is civil engineering. I have about 15 years now, um, different instrumentation and monitoring related projects from consulting to contracting and on the, uh, the product vendor side of things. So again, yeah, thanks for joining us. And Luke, I'll hand it back over to you. All right, so today I'm gonna to share with you guys um, some rail track monitoring we've been performing the last few years with Sensive. Uh, and this is on a, a project associated with construction of an extension to the existing light rail system in Minneapolis. Uh, and just a little background on that project, it's uh, about a 14 and a half mile extension to the existing system, uh, linking downtown Minneapolis to southwestern suburbs. And it is a, a large scale, uh, high profile project here, being the biggest public works project uh, cost wise in the state's history with a price tag of about 2.75 million. And that construction includes, uh, you know, building numerous stations, bridges, retaining walls, and one of the areas, or the area I'll be talking about, which is uh, a freight track adjacent to a cut and cover tunnel. So first I wanted to share uh, a photo here, it kind of lets you see the site conditions where we're performing the monitoring, but it also, the photo itself even helps you see why monitoring the freight track for deformation was necessary. So you can see, train passing through our construction site here, that gray concrete area to the right of the train, that's actually the top of the cotton cover tunnel, or at least a section of it. The entire tunnel is about three quarters of a mile long. Uh, but to construct the tunnel in this area, excavations had to extend down nearly 40 feet below the top of the tunnel elevation that you're seeing there. So you can imagine, you know, a massive open excavation that close to the track with the, the shoring on the left side of the, the tunnel there, really only uh, a few feet from the nearest edge of the track. So, I mean, just with the proximity and magnitude of that construction, uh, you know, there's definitely a potential impact to that track. So it's essential we had a reliable monitoring system uh, so we could assist in ensuring that that track was safe 
for trains to travel. And that's where we have our Sensive um, monitoring system in place. But before we had that in place, we actually had two different monitoring systems uh, that ultimately weren't weren't reliable. But I'm going to briefly cover those just to kind of point out the advantages we found with uh, the Sensive system. So first, we had a, a tilt meter monitoring system, and this was basically based off the project specs and requirements to monitor deformation of the track. And it was from another vendor we uh, we do like working with. And this application, it ended up the system wasn't the best fit. Uh, but the main disadvantage here to this system was that it was a wired system, uh, meaning all the sensors we were using, longitudinal and transverse sensors, were all connected in a series, uh, connected with cables and wires between each one. And ultimately, we just found that it was, uh, despite our best efforts to protect the cabling and conduit and the sensors themselves, and ended up folding and closing them in uh, uh, plywood covers. But we found that it was still easily damaged, especially the cables running between sensors. And then, uh, as you can see, photo on the right here, uh, our winters can be pretty brutal, but also with melting snow, uh, wet snow, or, or rain other times of the year, uh, there are lots of possibilities for moisture to get into the system. And despite being rated as weatherproof, we were having uh, frequent issues with moisture uh, getting in that system. And then anytime we had you know, either damage or moisture enter the system, it because it was wired in series, it was wiping out or causing erroneous data in all sensors uh, down the line in the series from where we were having the issue. So with that, I mean, we, were found, we found we were spending more time performing maintenance and repairs than we were collecting uh, valuable data on the condition of the track. So looking for a solution, we decided to take advantage of several automated total stations or AMTS units we already had in place on site. And typically I'm a fan of using an AMTS to monitor deformation. Um, and this was already doing a great job monitoring surrounding buildings and structures for deformation. But when it came to the track, again, we had uh, quite a few limitations that uh, made it not the most reliable system for, for monitoring the track. Mainly again, taking place in our brutal winters here in Minnesota. Um, if you're not familiar with the total station, it requires line of sight to a monitoring target or prism, uh, like shown in the, in the photo on the right here. Uh, reflects a laser off that target, and then doing that, it can measure the, the position of that target. But winter months, we found, you know, even a small snowfall would cover the glass lens of that prism or just completely bury the prism. And then again, we're finding ourselves back out there performing more maintenance, uh, clearing snow from the track, exposing these targets. And uh, meanwhile, we're not collecting any, any valuable information on the condition of the track. So at this point, again, uh, kind of all parties involved from the owner, railroad, ourselves, uh, you know, frustrated with the limitations of this system and again, looking for a solution, which is actually when the railroad operating in this area, uh, they were familiar with Sensive products from uh, other experience. So they'd actually recommended it to the project owner. Uh, and at that point, uh, well, that's when we got involved starting to work with Sensive. I think the different parties were maybe a little uh, hesitant to jump to a brand new monitoring system, considering uh, the limitations we've experienced with the, the previous ones. Uh, so we did initially was uh, working with Sensive, started a test run monitoring a, a small section of track, about a hundred foot uh, section of track for a few weeks, really just testing and, and demonstrating their, their capabilities. And uh, by the time we were through with that demonstration, all parties, you know, including the project owner, the uh, railroad, everyone was on board, and we went ahead with a, a full-scale uh, monitoring system for the track adjacent to this, this tunnel construction. And so what that consisted of were Sensive's nano triaxial tilt sensors. Uh, so that that white sensor you see in the photo, that's one of the one of the sensors. And they uh, directly measure any change in tilt of the tie. So I'll share in, a, in another slide on how we use that information. But some of the big advantages we found 
to this system was that we now had uh, sensors or monitoring points installed every 10 feet along the freight track, which was, you know, we couldn't reasonably do that with any of our previous monitoring systems. So we're now collecting data at a lot more locations. And then another huge advantage, especially compared to our AMTS system, was that we're getting a reading every five minutes from these sensors, whether they're buried in snow, there's a train passing by. We're always getting our reading. We don't have to rely on line of sight. And then, uh, you know, from that original wired monitoring system I shared, if if anyone's ever worked with wired instruments or really any electronics with wires or cables, you know, it's it's a hassle. So huge plus here, completely wireless. Each sensor uh, wirelessly set, communicates its data to a local cellular gateway. And then that gateway uh, through cell signal sends data, makes it available on Sensei's uh, monitoring website. All right, so I met, I mentioned the data we're collecting with these tilt sensors. Uh, the raw data is measuring change in tilt of that tie. So we're not necessarily interested in looking at, you know, degrees of tilt change in, in a tie. So what we had Sensei do was configure it, uh, the monitoring website. So by the time we're looking at any data, we're looking at deformation in inches. Uh, so one of these metrics we're looking at is uh, shown in the drawing here. Here, cross-level displacement. Um, really, just with a, a simple trig function, uh, we measured the directly measured the change in cross-level tilt of the tie. We know the track gauge, the distance between the rails, uh, so we can use that to determine this cross-level displacement uh, measurement shown in that drawing. And again, we're getting that measurement at 10-foot intervals along the along the whole track. And then what we're looking at, another useful metric, was the track twist. And this was really helpful because it was a way to uh, measure or monitor track deformation longitudinally uh, along the length of the track. Uh, and what this is, it's the change in cross-level displacement uh, over a specific length. Uh, but another huge plus to this is that the FRA uh, publishes standard threshold limits for both twist and cross-level displacement uh, that we can reference for, for different classes of track. All right, so I mentioned um, all the data we're collecting ends up living in Sensei's web monitor website. Uh, and this example, this image I have on the, on the side here is a, a screenshot from their website, but this is one of the spatial views available, which uh, I find most useful. Um, especially because we provide access to kind of all the parties involved on the project, whether it's owner, railroad, whoever needs to see this um, monitoring information. So in our case, we used a plan drawing uh, as, our, as our base image. Sometimes we use an aerial image. And uh, each one of those green icons is one of our tilt sensor nodes. So in this case, this was uh, a screenshot from our, our test run. But each one of those icons also has a tag beneath it, and we can choose what metric we want to appear, and it'll give us the most recent reading of that metric. In this case, we had uh, cross-level displacement in inches, and then we were looking at um, x-axis tilt for our test run. So again, it's really easy for anyone, no matter how familiar they are, just to jump in there. They know exactly what they're looking at. And if they want to see uh, more information or more details, you can just click on any one of those icons and it'll generate a plot of that metric. In this case, uh, this example is cross-level displacement over time. And uh, if you notice those two yellow bands uh, at the top and bottom of the graph, that's where we've set our alert limits for the project. So if we have a uh, if our sensor records a measurement exceeding one of those limits, in that spatial view, uh, that green icon will actually turn yellow for crossing that that yellow boundary. So again, that spatial view is kind of a one-stop shop for everything you need to know. You can quickly see if you have any issues and, and exactly where they are and easily get uh, uh, more info if you want it. And then again, 
if you do, uh, if we do cross one of those those limits, we'll get automated text and email alerts. And on our project, uh, we include well, we include a lot of parties on that. One of them being the track inspector, so he can get this alert on his phone, text message, go out to the site go exactly to the location we got that alert, um, you know, investigate, see if there's any maintenance or anything else that needs to be done. Uh, and it's a really smooth process. And, you know, oftentimes he'll go out there with his own kind of hand instruments and uh, he'll confirm or verify, you know, what we're seeing with our instruments he's measuring in the field as well. And so really we've been, we've had this implemented year and a half, two years now at this, at this site. And uh, we've been extremely happy with it. I you know, mentioned all the limitations we had with our uh, previous systems, and this has proven to be extremely, extremely reliable. We're not spending time, uh, you know, removing snow or doing useless uh, uh, maintenance out there. But kind of the biggest thing we've seen is that the project owner and railroad are really happy and comfortable with the uh, type of information we're able to provide to make sure that that track is is safe for trains to pass. So that's kind of a quick uh, run through of how we've applied this system to our projects. Uh, again, if there's questions, we'll have time to answer them at the end. But thanks for listening. And Dan, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. All right. Thank you very much. I should have control of the screen. Let me try with that first click. And yep, there we go. So yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, very interesting project. Um, I'm sure most people logged in here to learn about the project and, and the application, but had to do it justice by covering some some product specifications and, and features as well. So yeah, really appreciate that. So yep, uh, the product used on site by by Terracon was was the Nano Macro, which is a triaxial, triaxial tilt sensor node that Luke covered. Um, some features of this: the Nano Macro and our whole Nano uh, range of tilt nodes operate on our flat mesh network only. Uh, they don't operate on our point-to-point -point system, our LoRa system, which we call GON. So it's a flat mesh only uh, product. The nano macro tilt sensor node and, and all of our tilt sensor nodes have a variable sampling rate. Um, Luke showed there that they were using about five to 10 minutes on that product, which is a nice sweet spot. Still keeps a long battery life while getting frequent data. Um, but we do have the ability to go as low as every one second. So it's used in special cases. Um, if there's construction adjacent to track, pile driving, um, something that we need to, uh, to have high visibility on, there is the ability to drop that down to as frequent as every one second. These nodes are NFC capable. Uh, so by use of an NFC device and a Windows application, a Sensi Windows application, you can do some local configuration on the node itself, like turning it on or off. Um, you can force the sample to be taken and you can assign um, the node to different networks. So you can do all of that locally uh, without having to do that through the software, if need be. Uh, the shell there is a high impact polycarbonate shell uh, with no aerial, so that antenna is internal. So no risk of that, you know, in a track monitoring situation that trailing gear or, or maintenance or track inspectors, right, could accidentally uh, break an antenna. Um, in, inside of there, of course, because there's no aerial, is the battery, um, the MEMS tilt sensors, and the related electronics, all inside of that high impact polycarbonate shell. Uh, we provide a two-part track bed plate for track monitoring applications. So Sensi provides with their nodes different bracketry depending on the application. Of course, with this being a track monitoring application, it's the track plate. Um, features of that plate, that bottom plate is attached to top of the tie depending on the material. So concrete uh, normally will just use a high strength adhesive. If it's a wooden tie, you can use that adhesive along with some wood screws to zip it down into place. Also on that plate is a survey pin. You can sort of see on the right-hand side of that plate uh, is a survey pin to allow for uh, baselining the, the position or elevation of that sensor during install to allow for confirming movement, uh, you know, if needed by manual survey, um, checking it, the position at the end of the job, sort of as a closeout uh, operation, uh, or really in some cases, a complementary monitoring program allowing for the continuous monitoring by the node 
but to periodically check that with, with survey as an option. And then that top part of the plate attaches to the node itself to allow for quick installation um, or quick relocation. So the nodes are highly reusable, um, easy to move them down to uh, you know, different sections if we're monitoring along uh, track sections, easy to leapfrog those forward. It's a method that some companies use, some customers of ours, to be more cost effective with that. Um, but also just relocating it to another project, um, just ensuring that it's assigned to the, the right network uh, is very easy because they automatically connect to that network when in range. So lightly here, some uh, technical specifications. Uh, so as Luke mentioned, uh, there's triaxial tilt sensor nodes. What that means essentially is there's three MEMS tilt sensors in the X, Y, and Z position, which allow that node to be mounted at any orientation without any range limitation. So it makes installation quite easy. There's no leveling of the sensor required. When deploying our, our tilt sensor nodes in, in track monitoring applications, we always recommend our high G model, which essentially means that those tilt sensors on the inside of the node are protected and are able to withstand high levels of vibration, which is of course inherent in a track monitoring application. Up to 15 year battery life. So that's based on a 30 minute sampling rate. So of course, with the sampling rate variable, the battery life also is affected by that. However, we don't really see the battery life affected too much until you start going sub minute, even about one minute sampling rate, we still obtain an eight year, up to eight year battery life on that node. So very uh, low power, very long life sensor. Uh, capability of um, waterproof up to IP68. You know, being on track bed, of course, you know, flooding happens quite frequently and you know, different uh, environments. So that's a very important feature of the node itself. Uh, operating temperature uh, down to minus 40 Fahrenheit. Uh, thankfully, I haven't seen anything like that in, in the US, not even Minneapolis, Luke. Although during installation, it, it was pretty cold. Um, we do have a customer up in Canada though, who's, who's scratched that minus 40 um, on some active monitoring projects. Um, so, we have seen it go actually a little bit past that before with, with this customer up in, in Canada. And the, the gateway device. So you can see on the left-hand side there, there's a gateway with a solar panel. So that's the same gateway that uh, Luke and Terracon are using. So it's a fully integrated unit. Um, this is the brains of the operation. It controls the flat mesh network. Uh, internal to this makes installation when and powering the gateway with solar panel very easy. Um, it has an integrated solar charging circuit on the inside of that gateway device uh, with an internal rechargeable battery. So no external battery required with the flat mesh gateway. It's as simple as taking the lead from the solar panel and plugging it right into the uh, power input port on the bottom of that gateway device uh, for continuous operation. So what's nice about having the internal and rechargeable battery, and of course this is a low power system, is we can have uh, up to three weeks of battery life if that power input is lost. So if there's solar and it gets, you know, a storm comes through, blows it away, or it's vandalized, uh, we still have uh, about three weeks of battery life on that gateway to allow for predictive maintenance. And of course, you know, as voltage starts to drop, those alerts can go out to the user to inform them. 20 watt solar panel is really deployed on most projects in, in North America. There's some rare cases where it's increased to about a 45 watt solar panel, but uh, quite convenient with a small solar panel, um, you know, if there's like space constraints or, you know, portability of the system, uh, it's very low impact. Uh, all components are waterproof to IP68, including the, the connector. Uh, firmware, you know, this is an important one to talk about as well. Um, it's all remotely upgradable, two-way communication on flat mesh. Um, high bandwidth availability using 2400 megahertz radio allows us to do firmware updates all remotely over the air. Um, so you don't have to go on site and, and plug into it to, to do that. Uh, you do need internet access though, of course, uh, to, to make that happen. And lastly, uh, there's a micro USB connector on the bottom to uh, do some you know, higher tier technical maintenance if required um, or to access data. So uh, the gateway will also buffer and hold data if there's no internet connection. 
and that can be uploaded automatically once uh, network is reestablished. However, if that's not the case, that data can be downloaded from the gateway directly. And the flat mesh network. So uh, flat mesh, this is a proprietary technology, communication technology that Senseev uh, developed back in um, 2005. Uh, it operates on um, the global 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. Uh, our mesh technology is non-hierarchical, essentially means that each node in the system is not pointed to have to talk to a specific node to relay its message. They're all acting independently on an even uh, playing field, you can sort of say, and they're gonna choose their own path, best path back to the gateway device, optimizing uh, signal strength, RSSI signal strength, as well as minimizing the, the quantity of hops required to get to the gateway. So it automatically optimizes that on site. We do have the ability to create 32 hops. So a hop means a node talking to the next node to then relay its message to the gateway device. Well, we do have the capability to have up to 32 hops uh, to relay a message from nodes that may be further away from the gateway. On sites where there's concern about um, um, backup gateway, fail safe, uh, you know, this could be in, you know, hard to access areas, um, areas where uh, vandalism is a concern, um, potentially damage is a concern for one reason or another. Um, we can have a secondary gateway installed on site on the same network. And if that primary gateway is vandalized, lost, all nodes, the entire network, will uh, immediately redirect to that secondary gateway on site. Maximum network size. So we can have up to 100 nodes per flat mesh gateway. And a node also um, can be considered as a camera. So cameras and nodes together, if you are utilizing that on your project, you can have up to 100 of those per gateway device. Range. So range is up to 1,000 feet in optimal conditions from node to node or node to gateway. Um, so if you think about, um, you know, network configuration, um, if you're looking at it linearly, you know, up to 1,000 foot from node to node with those 32 hops. Now that's definitely stretching the system depending on the application um, and install, like on trackbed, that range is, is definitely impacted with that 2400 megahertz uh, communication. So on track bed, we're normally looking at around 10 to 20 foot spacing. We've seen uh, up to about 30 or so foot uh, connection range. However, keeping it at shorter distances allows for redundant paths, a denser network, a stronger network um, on that flat mesh. So that's something that we always work with and inform our customers of ahead of time, of course. And of course, right, compatible with a full range of geotech and structural sensors by way of our integration line of nodes um, outside of the tilt sensor used uh, by Terracon on this project and a couple other products on our uh, portfolio. Uh, last slide, quickly, how it works. So um, data flow, right? So on the top left-hand side, we have uh, the flat mesh network, which is being used on this project. We also have GeoAN, which is our, our LoRa-enabled point-to-point long-distance communication technology. So from the sensors on site, by way of some internet connection, whether that's cellular, uh, which was used on this job, uh, or Ethernet, which we have the ability to plug into, that data is transferred to a cloud server where a web monitor sits, and either the data can be interacted with on web monitor, or uh, we play very nice with the other software companies on the market and allow for um, FTP export of the data. We're also API enabled, so that data can be extracted um, by some third party software. So that actually wraps it up from, from my side and we can move to uh, Q&A here. And Luke, since I only have access to the, the questions here for some reason, I'll run through this list here and see what we have, and sure. I'll, I'll pose some or, or answer some. All right. What do we have? So uh, first one, um, yeah, Luke, maybe you can answer this one. Is there an ideal mounting location on each tie inside or outside of the track? 
And should devices be placed on alternating left, right sides longitudinally? So I think it's more about where does it matter where on the tie um, the node is placed. Sure. So in our case, we had the the freight track paralleling, uh, you know, the tunnel construction all on the same side uh, of the track. So we decided uh, to put those sensors on the outside of the tie nearest that that construction activity. I know it seems like sometimes certain railroads themselves will have a preference whether it goes inside or out, but for our purposes, I mean, when we're calculating the the cross level displacement, it assumes that that uh, tie is a rigid member, which you know it's not truly rigid. But as far as using it as a warning system, it we really haven't seen it make a difference where you you place it on there. Dan, would you agree with with that on your end as well? Yes, I, I certainly would, right? Because like you said, right, of course, the, the people that have the video on, you know, right, we treat that tie, like you said, as rigid elements. So wherever that node is along along the tie, you're going to get that same change in degree that we use as the raw measurement. And then it comes down to, right, communication, uh, where the gateway is located. Uh, yeah, next one here. Um, maybe, maybe together we can answer this one. Um, Right, so uh, it says, Luke said the stakeholders um, define the thresholds for the parameters on that project, like cross level or twist. Um, the question is, are, are those absolute values or, or relative? Um, if they are absolute, would that be possible with, with this approach? So I, I think I get what they're getting at where we see oftentimes project specifications are at least written with intent of manual survey or uh, uh, using a total station, uh, which was the case originally, I guess, on, well, at, at times during this project. Um, and that's where we would uh, reference the FRA uh, manual, which provides, uh, I guess, absolute limits for the, the cross-level tilt or cross level displacement and the, the track twist. Uh, so we are measuring those changes from the starting point. So it's not necessarily mm -hmm. an absolute uh, uh, cross level displacement, but it if we know from the beginning that the track is in an acceptable condition uh, and we know it's changed so much, it, we know then when it's uh, out of tolerance, if that helps answer your question. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, next here, uh, how, how long do the nano tilt sensors take to install? So b besides you guys needing needing to having to use a, a blowtorch to get the ice off the <laughs> the top of the tie, um, you know, we we normally say somewhere around three to five minutes max once you get moving. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's. I mean, we install all kinds of instrumentation, and these are by far the easiest instrument we've had to install other than you know there's some directional arrows on the uh, sensor itself really all you're doing is gluing that that plate down to the tie and then if you want to or if you have wood ties uh, screwing it down as well so it is a quick installation mm -hmm. yep thanks uh, we have a, a question related to uh, the the previous one about absolute in relative, um, maybe I'll, I'll take this one for sake of variety. Uh, varying instruments are, are measuring relative displacement and or tilt, either longitudinally and or transversely. How to monitor the real time absolute displacement or tilt of, of various instruments. So again, because the tilt nodes um, are measuring uh, tilt, right, at its single position, it's not referencing some other uh, base station or some other reference point outside of where it's measuring. So all measurements utilizing a tilt sensor are always going to be relative to themselves, relative to what they're attached to. So that's their bracketry and then the bracketry, what that's attached to. So it's always going to be a, a relative measurement. Um, about longitudinal and transverse, uh, on the top of the node, of course, you have your, your directions. You know, what you try to do is you try to line those axes up with the, um, the, the direction that you want to monitor movement in. 
So in this case, along the tie and against the tie. Against the tie would be along the length of the track. So if you want to look at this um, as far as relating one sensorized tie, I'll call it to the next sensorized tie, you know, you, you can look at that relative movement of one tie, look at the next one, and, and that's how Terracon did their twist measurements. Uh, but it's not absolute measurement, so you can't really relate one to the other um, without making some assumptions on the rigidity of the track. And that's when we start getting into looking at uh, an estimated longitudinal profile of, of the track. Happy, happy to discuss that more in, in more detail if you want to contact uh, you know, Luke or, or myself. Um, let's come through here. Uh, for, for the project, there's a question, Luke. Uh, yeah. Was a dip calculation used for this project? I think you touched upon that briefly. Yeah, so there's a, a simple trig function, uh, inverse tangent, using the measured change in tilt, cross-level change in tilt um, that the sensor measures on the tie. And then we know the track gauge or the, the distance from rail to rail. So with those values and using that inverse tangent function, that's how we calculate the uh, cross-level displacement. And that's all done. That's nothing, you know, we have to do ourselves. That's all done in the monitoring website before we even even see it. So we're just viewing it uh, all after it's been processed. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I can take this one. It was stated a gateway can support up to 100 nodes. Is that at any collection rate or do you need to decrease collection as you increase nodes? So that, that's certainly a very good question. So um, there is a point within that band of 100 nodes that um, you're not able to pull off sub-minute collection. So up at 100 nodes, I would say you're not going to be able to um, reliably sample at one second. However, you will be reliably able to sample at 60 seconds, for example. And that's something that we can look at. There's a table uh, for that sort of comparison. Comes down to a bandwidth thing. So yeah, good question. That's certainly a consideration. Uh, yeah, next one. Uh, what is the accuracy of the system, millimeter or, or centimeters? Uh, I, can, I can take that one too. Well, I didn't cover too much of that resolution repeatability, uh, but the tilt nodes are repeatable at point triple zero five degrees in each axis. So if you take the, the degree and you apply that to a set length or a, uh, some structure it's attached to, we're certainly monitoring in submillimeter in that respect. Uh, is it some duplicate style questions? Let's see. Um, I guess a good one for you since you're, you have these on project, Luke. Uh, has there been any theft of these units? Has there been any theft? Um, what do you suggest to protect them from from theft or damage? Did you experience any of that on your project? So again, we have all kinds of instruments out on uh, on this project, you know. Uh, and with the sensitive instruments themselves, we haven't had any issues with that. I don't think they look that uh, I don't know enticing. Uh, maybe maybe <laughs> the solar panel would, but it, you know that hasn't uh, been an issue for us with this system. Although other instruments we've had elsewhere we've had you know batteries or, or solar panels uh stolen from the site uh, i mean you can always try to chain it up and prevent that but i suppose if someone wants it bad enough they could could get it um but as far as preventing damage so I, you might have noticed in the the photo where we had the nodes installed on the ties we screw in uh, like six inch marking whiskers next to each each node just helps uh you know, make it more visible for maintenance, people walking down the track, or even if we have to find one for some reason when there's snow on the ground. Uh, so that's been helpful in avoiding damage. Yep, great, thanks. In addition to that, outside of um, there, I've seen some customers actually change the screws used and use uh, their own custom security screws, which makes it harder for someone to remove those, um, you know. People will always be motivated. Depends how motivated they are. I suppose you're just trying to make it uh, harder for them from a you know a, a theft perspective. Um, yeah, about the calculations, <clears throat> we have one here. I guess this is more for for sensitive. Do you have a specific module to make calculation of rail cant twist and settlement? 
So uh, in, in Web Monitor, we can do this. We also have uh, some customers actually do this uh, in different software because you know with the rail cant and twist, it's pretty straightforward, right? In that, Luke, you covered a bit about that. It's a trigonometric function using the rail gauge, which is the distance from rail to rail on the tilt. And then looking at that uh, vertical movement and seeing the change and your change is you're changing cross level from top of rail to top of rail. Um, the twist is comparing one to the next. And then in the settlement, um, we do actually have some equations that we use, uh, which allow you to change um, distance from node to node. Uh, and all of that is input into Web Monitor. So, uh, so yes, we, we do have that availability in our software. But I will say that in addition to that, uh, we do have customers or other software uh, partners who built out that capability uh, in their software as well. And at the end of it, for them, we're providing them with the, the product, the raw measurement, and then, um, and then they can do calculations on, on their own. So we can work different ways, both ways in that. Uh, related to that, it's a good question about using absolute measurements and tilt nodes together, complementary. Um, with proper assumptions, do you see value to survey in some prisms and tie the system to absolute measurements? I guess, Luke, did you consider that or use that for this project or, or see value in that in this case? Or, I mean, we found the cross-level displacement and the, the twist values we're using have been a you know, a good warning system for us. So we really haven't uh, considered that on our end. There is, which I'm not sure either, either one of us had mentioned the, uh, well, you brought it up a little bit, the um, uh, settlement profile, the approximate mm -hmm. or, you know, assumed settlement profile too, which sure. kind of works like an inclinometer if you're familiar with that, where each node acts as a joint and you kind of uh, project the trajectory to the next uh, next node to come up with a settlement profile. That's an overly simplified uh, version of what it's capable of. But in that case, we uh, we we worry or we do use that as uh, kind of supplemental information on our project. Uh, and in that case, we have nodes extended far out on either end where we assume they're a fixed position. And in that case, there'd be value in you know surveying that initial fixed position um, mm. to create that settlement profile. But but we haven't found the need to do that ourselves. Right, right. Yeah, and on, on, on top of that, um, we we have seen certainly a complementary monitoring approaches where you know, there may be a, a prism attached to the, the bracket that the node is on and monitoring them complementary, you know, taking advantage of the nodes to provide that, you know, early warning, uh, continuous data stream. And then of course, uh, still being able to tame obtain absolute measurements um, that's costly and that's a lot to manage I know in, in some cases especially in, in your project's case right where their line of sight was a certainly a large consideration um, in, in the calculation though it does assume a fixed start and you can choose to have a fixed end in that longitudinal profile dip calculation so so yes I, that could be a method used to answer that question where you are taking uh, that start and end um, geodetically to understand if uh, that, that movement is absolute, if, it, if it's fixed, in order to be reliant upon the, the, the longitudinal profile calculation. Yeah. Um, how does system handle temperature effects? Well, here in Minneapolis, you've seen probably what, up to 70 F, maybe more, and then down to you know freezing temperatures. Yeah, we see a big range here. I mean, in the in the data we collect on a daily basis, you can kind of see a cyclical trend as the sun's out, track warms up. You know, you can uh, it really correlates well to the the temperature in the day. Um, as far as performance or anything, we haven't. You know, it's always been consistent. Great. Yep. Thank you. Because um, we have time for a few more here. Um, this one, I guess I can take this one. Does the gateway have an Ethernet port or external cell antenna? Uh, does it support external antennas radio? Um, if monitoring a tank or underground, for example, 
the gateway will have poor cell signal if placed in the tank or poor signal uh, outside of the tank. So, so yes, uh, both. We have a version of um, the flat mesh gateway, which has a ethernet port. So you could run that ethernet cable to another source, uh, you know, maybe above ground or in a, or in a location where there's, um, where there's a place to put an external modem or plug into a router, for example, you know, if that's the scenario. Um, the, the external radio antenna, which connects to the nodes and the external antenna um, for cellular, those could also, you can use um, coaxial cable to extend those out. You wanna be careful on how far you go when using coax, because you can have um, signal loss, um, but we can always look at one of, one of the two options in that scenario. So th those are both options, yeah. And uh, there, there's a few more here. I will take, we can take one more. Uh, can you integrate other types of sensors into the same flat mesh platform um so yes uh we we have the the tilt nodes of course that we've been covering here the, the track tilt sensors that luke and terracon used uh sensive um has uh other other products other sensor nodes uh the optical displacement sensor node is one we also have integration nodes or data logger nodes some people call them which allow you to plug in third-party um, geotech or structural sensors, uh, essentially enabling them, making them wireless and communicating into the into the platform. So it does need to be a sensitive node to connect into the flat mesh platform, but in a lot of um, projects, uh, third-party manufacturer external sensors can be plugged into those nodes and then that data routed into the flat mesh network. So yeah, I think we covered uh, the bulk of those. I don't see any more coming in. So yeah, I'll go ahead and, and click this screen, which should say thank you on it. <laughs> so yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining. Thanks for the, uh, the engagement um, and the, uh, the really good questions. Thanks everyone.